My name is Sean Dooley. I'm the editor of Australian Bird Life and author of several books on bird watching, including The Big Twitch. And I would like to start tonight's proceedings by acknowledging that we are meeting today on the traditional lands of the Boonwurrung people of the Kulin Nation. And I'd like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and to pay my respects to the elders of any other communities who may be with us here today. Further, I would like to pay my respects to the Boonwurrung people for their custodianship of the land on which Melbourne stands. Those elders of the past wouldn't recognise the once biological diverse landscape that they knew 180 years ago. And since that, that time, we've applied all our industry that we have to try and bugger it up completely. Uh, but as nature is resilient, and even, even today, we can just step outside this building and within five minutes uh, of just a few minutes walk, we can encounter many examples of the rich natural world that we have inherited from those elders. Now, there are many of us who now recognise that we cannot continue on this path, but convincing the majority of the public and our politicians that we need to change is no easy task. It has been said often that conservation is as much about people as it is about nature. And the cornerstone, uh, the cornerstone foundation of conservation is to get people to give a flying fox about nature, to ignite some spark uh, within them, to, to engender that sense of wonder that we all had as children as we engaged with the world for the first time. And tonight's guest, Jim Robbins, has written a fascinating book that may, I hope, be the spark that some of us need. Uh, Jim is a regular, uh, regular contributor and writer to publications such as the New York Times and other esteemed journals, though I note, Jim, that you have not yet graced the pages of Australian BirdLife magazine. <laughs> But uh, don't be disheartened because it took Spielberg a long time to win that Best Picture Oscar, so there's still <laughs> hope yet for you. Um, for more than 35 years, Jim has been a brilliant communicator, writing in particular most evocatively about the natural world. His, his most recent book, The Wonder of Birds, is truly a wondrous read. Uh, as somebody who deals in birds every day, in, in a professional sense, people, um, I, even I can sometimes lose that sense of wonder that first uh, ignited a passion for birds in me. The beauty of this book is that even when it was covering aspects of birds that I thought I knew well, it, it managed to reignite that sense of wonder on, on, on almost every page, Jim. There, there was something that even if I knew about it, I'd forgotten or it had a new aspect to, to the wondrous nature of birds. So before we drill down into this book, which is a fabulous read, and I, I would like to say that uh, in Bigham Books, we'll be selling uh, books that Jim can sign. You've been, you've been uh, press ganged there. Uh, he'll be signing afterwards. So I highly recommend the book. But before we drill down into it, I, I'd like to start by asking Jim a more personal question. Um, for a lot of bird watchers, there's what's called uh, a spark bird, a bird that uh, that somehow encaptures that the imagination, that captures the imagination. Uh, for me, it was a glossy ibis down at Seaford Swamp when I was at Seaford North Primary School in Grade Six, and this bird, which for those who don't know, it's sort of the size of a large chook, a bit sort of pooey, chocolatey brown, really, from a distance, with a, a bill like an ibis. Uh, because it's our smallest ibis, but the, the magic of that bird to see the iridescence of its plumage sparkling in the sun and also to know that that bird was a rare bird and as an 11-year-old to know that I had that knowledge already that what I was looking at was something special was a very empowering and intoxicating moment. So I want I wanted to ask, Jim, I know that you're not a, a twitcher as such uh, or a sort of what you might call a hardcore birder, but was there a spark bird for you that got you interested in, in, this, in writing this book? Yes, there was. First, let me say thank you, everyone, for coming. I, um, it's funny to land in a place I've never been before and to have many people turn out for your talk. That's a nice thing. And I love the Australian tradition of... Um, 
of these kinds of talks and books and, and the literary world. And um, I've been humbled, and thank you. Uh, yes, the bird I probably, that fired my imagination about birds was, uh, was a peregrine falcon. I don't know if they have those here in uh, Australia. Yes, we actually have a, a pair that nest in, uh, in one of the skyscrapers in Colvin Street each year. I went, uh, I went and flew one when I was working for an environmental group. I think it was 1980, maybe 1979. And um, this fellow named uh, Maury, Nelson, uh, Maury Nelson, he um, flew peregrines, and we went out to this hilltop above Boise, Idaho, and he had this peregrine in the back of this pickup truck. This is the last part of the book. I mentioned this. And he let that bird go. And, and it was the bird itself was amazing. But the transformation that came over him as he watched this bird fly just was also amazing. And it stayed with me ever since. And that led me to write my fir very first magazine article, which was about something called the Birds of Prey Natural Area in southern Idaho, which has more nesting raptors than any place in the world outside of a, a place in uh, somewhere in Africa, a Matapos, it's called. And so uh, I spent three days researching this article and, and just to see all of these birds of prey close up was, was absolutely fascinating. And that's, I guess, where my bird career began. <laughs> and I, I want to get on later, later to, the, um, to, to the way that birds do engender that sense of wonder in people and the way people interpret that. But I was wondering if we could start seeing you were talking about the, um, the peregrine falcon, the fastest, the fastest animal on the planet, I believe, as it goes into that Stuka dive bomb mm -hmm. uh, after a sort of unsuspecting pigeon or starling. Mm -hmm. um, the thing that allows that bird to achieve such velocity is, is the feathers. And I was wondering if you could begin by talking about the wonder of feathers, their construction and, and what they're used for. Yeah, and you know, every aspect of a bird, it turns out, is very complicated <laughs> and, and, and uh, there's a lot there when you start to burrow into this. It's not just feathers, it's also the musculature, uh, it's the feet. Uh, peregrines hunt with their feet and it turns out bird feet are unlike any other animal's feet. The, the researcher I I talked to said that they're like a Leatherman tool. They can do anything a bird wants it to do. Mm. Um, feathers are, no one really knows what feathers were first for. The, they weren't for flying because they were found on dinosaurs before there was flight. Um, they were probably for protection. Feathers can, can take a bird through the densest undergrowth and protect it, yet they're extremely light, feather light. Um, they, uh, they're colorful, they're an attractant to uh, other, the other um, sex of the species. And so they serve a lot of different uses for birds as well as for humans. We put them in our jackets, we put them in our blankets, we put them in our, our, down, uh, our down booties. Uh, they're universal. There's a, a Netflix, I think it's a Netflix video called People of the Feather. It's about a, a peop, a people in, uh, I think it's Inuits in the Arctic, who, whose whole life depends on being able to use feathers for, for warmth and to live there. Um, so it's, it's, there's this rich topic there of feathers, and they, they uh, didn't evolve from something else. They're their own thing, which is one of the things I learned. Uh, they couldn't have begun as something else, so somehow along the way, uh, a feather originated as a feather and uh, it's been evolving ever since. Mm. And what, what's the construction of a feather? I mean, there, there are different types, obviously, but uh, for different parts of the bird. But you're able to just what I found uh, excellent in in the book was a lot of concepts that I so, sort of knew vaguely knew, like what's a feather. Mm -hmm. uh, suddenly became you have this really great skill of, of kind of condensing a lot of very difficult information but but making it seem suddenly like light bulbs were going on mm -hmm. okay can you share with us like just the construction of a feather very uh, feather 101 uh, <laughs> well there, it's made out of keratin which is the same thing that our hair is made out of in our fingernails very light protein um, there are different kinds of feathers they have a tendency in birds to overlap 
and they, they lock together to keep the bird. Actually, what, what they do in a bird wing is they lock together when the bird is uh, going down to give it loft, but when the bird is going up, the, the feathers come apart. So there's a zip, a zipper-like effect that only works one way. So when the bird is going up, it, it doesn't have a resistance, but when it's coming down, it gets a resistance so, so it can fly better. Um, this is one of the things I call it a kind of an eco-technology that nature invented. And we can't do anything close to this kind of a thing. And this is kind of where I hope to kind of bring out some of the wonder of these things. I mean, it's absolutely amazing. We, we have a tendency to think that humans have done all of these amazing things. But when you look at nature, it's been doing this for 100, over 100 million years, especially when it comes to birds. And it's figured a lot of these things out, which is, of course, we're starting to appreciate this more. Um, but one of the researchers I talked to about about flight and feathers told me that, you know, our aircraft are downright crude compared to, to bird flight. He said a bird can go from 40 miles an hour to a dead stop on top of a cattail that's waving in the wind. And we have nothing that can come mm. close to that. So we have a long way to go before we can mimic some of these, these eco-technologies that, that birds have. So maybe we, rather than getting Elon Musk to reinvent the bus, we can um, maybe direct him in the, in, in, down the feather path. For a few well, things. I would say this, rather than, than have Elon Musk take us to Mars, which he's talking about now, let's figure out what we have on this planet. Mm. Yes. It's, <laughs> yes, definitely. It's, and, and there's so much in the book about what we do have on this planet and how little, what really comes across, the amazing, the, the amazing jam-packed facts in the book as, as you, you also express how little we actually know about birds. Keeping on the feather theme for, for a second uh, in terms of flight, uh, it was a you had a fascinating discussion there on the theories of how birds came to fly. Um, and the, the, the sort of the competing theories. But, but you sort of arrive at a point, well, you t quote researchers who seem to arrive at a point which is a, a bit of column A, a bit of column B. Are, are you able to elaborate on, on the origins of flight or what we think currently on the origins of flight? So I, I call this book an in interpretation of birds. Um, with a little imagination, we can interpret a lot of things at a much deeper level. I think that's what this book does and what my, where my interests lie. I, I did, wrote a story, I wrote a book about trees as well. I think the same thing applies there. There's much more going on than we know. So how do we ask creative questions and do a, a creative interpretation? Um, and that's what Ken Dial, this fellow at the University of Montana has done. He's studied birds for, well, he's in his 60s. He's now an emeritus professor. And he has studied birds probably for 40 years. He's been all over the world for a television show. And, and he's really quite an expert in, in animal locomotion is the field. But he's, he's studied birds only. Um, and he has um, done things like put hummingbirds in wind tunnels and put other birds in wind tunnels and hook them up to x-ray machines so he can watch their muscles when they're flying. And, and this whole broad range of, of tests that they give to birds to understand more about flight dynamics. And at the, toward the end of his, his career, uh, his students challenged him. He was talking about the origin of flight in dinosaurs. And the two theories are that birds, or excuse me, dinosaurs were running and leapt up to grab an insect and had wings, had, had proto wings and, and could fly or that they somehow got up on a rock or a tree and jumped out and soared, and that's how they, um, that's how they first flied, flew. It's called, that's called the ar arboral perspective or the arboral idea that birds started in trees. Cursorial is that they were running along the ground. Those are the two main theories, but they're all based on fossils. So Ken's idea was to study living birds to try and apply uh, their physiology to this idea of, of flight. And he got chucker partridges, which are a ground nesting bird. Ground nesting birds are precocial birds. Um, there's two types of birds that when they're born. One is a precocial, one is altricial. 
Altricial birds are the naked, helpless birds in a nest that need to be fed and cared for by their parents. And then the precocial birds are those birds that can move around, run, escape predators early on, right after they're born. Like, it, like the Australian brush turkey. Yes, is. the Australian brush turkey is something called super precocial, <laughs> which means See, on super. day one, <laughs> the babies can run and climb and evade predators better than the parents. And uh, I've never seen an Australian brush turkey. I'm told they're quite common. You can see them near shopping malls and things here. Yes, they're, they're making their way down. Uh, we should get them in Melbourne if climate change continues in about 25 years. Uh. But, but yeah, and, and they, they are super precocial because they have the, the birds, if you've been up to Queensland or even in Sydney now, they build large mounds of, of uh, essentially humus and they, um, the, they put the eggs in there like a regulate the temperature and the chicks have to dig their way out. So mm -hmm. they've already been digging for a day before they hit the surface. So they're kind of super duper precocial. <laughs> and I'm told turkeys and chickens are the closest genetically to mm. dinosaurs of all the birds. And they look like dinosaurs. We have turkeys <laughs> coming back where I live in, in Montana in the States. And when I come out some mornings, I, I just you almost can see a dinosaur. I mean, it, it's amazing how, how they are. Um, they're big and fast. My dog is no match for these, these turkeys. Um, so he looked at baby chucker partridges, which are precocial, and he uh, put them on, in a laboratory and put hay bales in, and he noticed that they were climbing, and they were climbing quite well at a very young age, and then they were jumping off the hay bales. And um, it turns out that a, what he thinks is that a baby chucker partridge from the time it's born until the time it flies is kind of a microcosm of how flight happened in dinosaurs. And so the baby's born and it can run very fast. And, and, and the question with the origin of flight is why would, a, why would a dinosaur be born with wings if it couldn't fly in the first place? So what is the, what is the early stage of a wing why would you have one? And the, the, it goes back, this question goes back to the 1800s. And the question is, what good is half a wing? Uh, it's like the same question with eyes evolutionarily. What, what good is an eye that's forming if you can't use it for sight? And it, it's one of those things that was used to disprove evolution, the, these ideas. But what he found is that baby birds, these chuckers, use... Um, you were, were born and they use their, their half a wing as a, a way to balance themselves when they're running and a way to hold themselves down close to the ground. And then as they get older, the wings form more fully and when they jump off of a hay bale, they can use it to glide to the ground and then toward the end of their, their few weeks, they're, they're starting to fly. And this has is, is led him to propose this idea that when dinosaurs first started to form, wings, they use those, those proto-wings as a way to balance themselves, as a way to enhance their running and their climbing to escape predators. But then some of them, which had a more, had a larger type wing, um, when they jumped off a rock, uh, they could glide. And then uh, those, as evolution goes, uh, they, were, they were better able to evade predators. And so over time, they, the, the uh, birds with larger wings were selected and selected and selected again. So pretty soon the wings were getting bigger and bigger, and those are the ones that made it, and, um, and so today we have birds. And that, in a nutshell, is, is the story of evolution of flight, according to Ken Dial. <laughs> Done. <laughs> <laughs> but this, this is how, I, what I think is as, as interesting as that is, is this, these are the kind of questions we need to ask. We need to realize that there's a lot more going on with birds and many other things in nature that we've only really scratched the surface in a lot of ways. Mm. And that's what I think is important. And, and so that's why I highlighted some of these ideas. Mm. And interestingly, out of that was the, um, you're saying, you know, obviously birds have been the inspiration for flight from da Vinci and before. But, but you're saying we're still only, as you said earlier tonight, just scratching the surface in terms of what we know. And I, I was fascinated to, to read that um, only 
relative recent decades, the design, aircraft designers had noticed how birds of prey often have upswept tips to the wings. Mm. And I think you, you wrote that they, um, you see that now on, on the, the jet aircraft and that's saved something like 10% of fuel costs mm -hmm. or, so, or something. I, I don't remember the amount, but yeah, yeah. It's just that little tweak to the wing. Mm. So just that inspiration and that has so many flow on effects in terms of not the, the you know, the, the costs to the airlines are less, but also the amount of, uh, the, the amount of pollutants that are going into the atmosphere is, mm -hmm. uh, is obviously reduced. Although I'm sure the airlines put the costs by making more of those aeroplanes. <laughs> There's a, a field called biomimicry. I don't know if people have heard of this, but it's using nature to inspire design in products. And birds have given us a lot of ideas about how to do that. There's a, a story in the book about the kingfisher, and uh, there was a bullet train in uh, in Japan, mm -hmm. and it was making noise, a lot of like almost like a sonic boom as it came out of a tunnel. And so the engineer looked at things to kind of trying to decide uh, how to design um, the front of a train so it wouldn't make these loud noises. And what he did is he went to the kingfisher because it. Do you have kingfishers here in Australia? Yes, okay. yes, we do. So he went to the kingfisher and found, because when it goes into the water, it's so uh, aerodynamic, or hydrodynamic, I guess, going into the water, <laughs> that it, it's able to cleave the water with very little disruption. And so he modeled the, the front of this bullet train after the kingfisher's nose or beak. Mm. Uh, so. <laughs> and speaking of inspiration, the other, when I think of birds, the two things that really inspire I think a lot of people are, are flight, but also song. Um, if we could move on to that, the uh, the not just uh, you write about the how um, bird song has has uh, inspired musicians over uh, over over the centuries, including like uh, Oliver Messian. I, I hope I pronounce his name correctly. Who essentially. Uh, most of his career was transcribing and interpreting birdsong for for orchestra. Uh, the French the French composer, um, the the bird's ability to sing is is quite uh, or vocalise is quite different to that in a mammal. Can you explain the difference between um, or try and encapsulate the difference between a bird's uh, syrinx, uh, is, is it syrinx? Syrinx. syrinx mm -hmm. and, the, and the larynx and, and how that impacts on the way birds can communicate. Just a small topic there. Okay, <laughs> uh, let me think about that. So a syrinx is a small bony structure in the, in the birds uh, uh, between the two lungs, the lobes of the lung. It's named after uh, uh, a, um, let's see, the god, the god Pan was chasing a young, what were they? I'm not sure what they were called, goddess or, uh, anyway, her name was Syrinx and she was afraid of this guy, he was lusty. And they were down by the river as the Greeks tell the story. And Pan was chasing her and she got scared and she asked for help and she was turned into a reed. And um, Pan was so, Pan is I think the guy with the half horse or half mm. and half god. He was so angered that he, pulled the reed and ma fashioned it into pan pipes and played it. And so that, that became the name for the searing. So the, this goddess's name was, was searing. So really Syrinx. that was quite a helpful thing for searing. Yeah. <laughs> Please help me. Yeah, me somebody was reed. very literary when they named the searing. <laughs> uh, so, um, but uh, when a bird sings, it can play the searing from either lobe of the lung. And so it can, it can play a lot, very complicated melodies from from either side of its, of its lungs, and that's why birdsong is so complicated. Um, it's, been the stu it's been studied probably longer than almost any other subject when it comes to birds. Um, and nobody really knows what they're saying when they sing. There are you know, general, generalizations that they are um, claiming territory or they are attracting mates. But a lot of the details of, of the songs are really not known. Mm. Um, the, um, it's, I'm fascinated by the, the, uh, the, their ability to essentially double track. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a, 
you, you mentioned in the book the, um, the I think it's the brown thrasher. Uh, has got the is it the brown thrasher with largest, the largest uh, repertoire mm -hmm. of of different uh, is it different notes or different sounds it can make? Uh, we I think number two uh, from what I understand is the Australian magpie, mm. which is uh, a uh, not, not related to the magpies and crows of of northern hemisphere, but they certainly. Uh, I'm sure our Australian audience will be very familiar with the warbling and caroling of, of the Australian magpie. And I remember speaking to a, a bird sound recordist and he was out here um, from the States and recording those calls. And also I have a musician friend who became obsessed with them and he played me the, the magpie call slowed down. And you can hear it double track. Uh, so it's like doing a bass note over in one side and then kind of a melody over the top. Um, so, so, so what we sort of hear with our kind of fairly basic hearing is, is just that song. But uh, you, you, so you're saying that, that we still are only, again, scratching the surface on, right. on what, the, what those calls mean. The birds have very different senses than we do. Their vision is, is some birds, is much more powerful than human vision and they can see ultraviolet light. Mm. which we can't see. And presumably, it's hard to study uh, how an animal listens. Their audio cortex in the brain is very much like ours, almost identical. But somehow, they're able to probably unpack these, these complicated uh, melodies and understand a lot more about what a bird is, other bird is saying with its song. Um, birds make two kind of sounds, calls and songs. And so the other, other aspect of this are calls. And chickadees, which we, we talked a little bit about in the green room, are um, probably have the most sophisticated animal language on the planet. And it's open-ended as, as is the human language in that um, there's no end to the recombination of, of phonemes. They have phonemes like we do, which are sounds. There's no end to the recombination to make uh, words and sentences um, so it's a very complex language. And I've, I've interviewed um, people who study chickadee language in Montana. Where, eh, Montana has a very, one of the top institutions for bird studies in the US. And uh, Eric Green is the, is the biologist there. And he, he said that chickadees not only have this amazing conversation among themselves, but if you brought a chickadee to Japan or to Australia, the chickadees here would understand it. And not only would the chickadees understand it, but the squirrels and rabbits and other, other animals would understand chickadee. And people have been trying to get to the bottom of chickadee uh, for over 100 years. It's one of the most studied aspects of, of animal language. And they think if they can figure out what chickadees are saying, they can figure out much of what the animal world is talking about <laughs> behind our backs. <laughs> It's uh, th there's uh, we, we don't actually get chickadees in Australia, uh, but we do have a uh, there's uh, a bird. Well, uh, of course, uh, the songbirds, the passerines, evolved in Australia as, as far as we understand. So we have the longest history going back of of bird song in in that sense of singing birds. And one bird that I know researchers have studied is the uh, the chestnut crowned babbler, which is found out in the deserts of um, or the semi-arid country around places like Broken Hill, and they've the language is lots of yahooing and cackling and things. So I don't think it's as, as extensive a vocab as as the chickadee. But I was really interested to see they published research a couple of years ago about the phonemes and how they construct them in different um, different combinations to indicate different. Uh, different threats. So if there's a snake or a hawk or something like that, they will put those little syllables in different orders. So, Ds. Yeah. yeah so yeah. With, is, with the chickadees, is it is it a threat um, uh, announcement or yes. is, is it more like oh there's there's a good there's a good seed bed over here or a good there's a berry bush with good berries over here? Are they yeah, getting probably that close? all so, those things. Um, what they've noticed is this researcher was had some chickadees he was studying, and he brought in a pygmy owl. Pygmy owls eat chickadees. Um, and um, he noticed that when the chickadees 
uh, were telling other chickadees about the big meow, they had, I don't remember the number of Ds on the end of their, their <laughs> sentence, but it was D, 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 and he counted them. It was like something like 20 Ds on the end. But when he brought in a, a great horned owl, which don't eat chickadees, there were only a couple of Ds on the end. And so as he studied this, he found that, that one of the ways they warn other birds about pygmy owls, a, a, a big threat to chickadees, is by adding Ds onto the end of their sentence. And, and, it's, it's, uh, and it's, again, still one of these things we really don't understand. This is one, one mm -hmm. small part of it we've discovered. You talked about you don't have chickadees here. One of the interesting... You have starlings, though, right? Yes, yes, indeed. One of, we have starlings. They're a big problem in, in the U.S. They're mm, a pest. Same, same here. <laughs> yeah, and one, how they got to the U.S. is in the 1800s, this guy decided he wanted to bring every bird that was mentioned in the works of Shakespeare to the United States. <laughs> and starlings are mentioned... I, I forget the play. It's in the book, but... Uh, uh, he brought starlings over, and ever since then, we've had we have starlings. They almost wiped out the bluebird in our country. Um, mm -hmm. They uh, they compete for the same size hole for nesting, and they were almost wiped out. And then I think it was in the 1970s that people discovered what was going on, and they launched a campaign to build bluebird nests all over um, the United States to rescue the bluebird from obscurity. Mm. I'm sticking with starlings for for a second. Uh, you were talking before about the oral cortex or, or the, the part of the brain that processes sound. Um, I wanted to touch on, on the, the concept of bird brains, uh, which is, as your book shows, is no longer a, a taunt. It's actually a, quite a compliment. Um, the, the starlings, I thought, are, are a good example, and, and combining that with the idea of flight, we've people have probably seen those, those magnificent murmurations of starlings, where you get tens of thousands of birds all flying seemingly as one organism through the air, and they'll make those amazing shapes. You, you go into quite a lengthy discussion on on what might be going on there, um, but a lot of it comes down to, to the way they're they're brains are able to process so much information to do with flight and their spatial awareness. Uh, you, can you just quickly take us through some of the, uh, some of the theories of, of what, how birds don't fly into each other and, and, uh, uh, and how they manage to negotiate such incredible manoeuvres with seemingly without a, a leader to, to show them the way? There's... Um Something called a, it's called metacognition. They believe researchers believe that there is a mind that takes over with a flock that is greater than the sum of its parts. And the individual birds all come together by the thousands. They create a, a metacognition or a meta awareness that is about survival. Um, probably the leading. Uh, researcher, it's, it's called flock intelligence or swarm intelligence. Probably the leading researcher is, is Ian Kazin at um, the Max Planck Institute of Ornithology. And he thinks there's some sort of very rapid information transfer going on between birds, and certain birds are leaders. It's a little bit complex, but they kind of maintain their awareness of each other, and, and it's a very rapid dissemination of, of, of location information. They're trying to apply this, this fundamental dynamic to humans as well, to, to study uh, whether there's some sort of swarm intelligence when people leave a soccer stadium by the thousands or um, when people invest in the stock market. No one really knows. It's still one of the great mysteries is, is how this all happens. And then there's people like... Um, Rupert Sheldrake, who believe they have m more of a telepathic communication between birds. Um, whatever it is, uh, it's, a, it's a group mind, and, and these birds get together and they vote, essentially. Uh, they, they move in unison, but then they also make decisions in unison. They, uh, they vote on which way to migrate, when, when to leave, when to feed, where to feed, when to, when to breed. And... Ian Kazin believes that it's possible that one of the things uh, wiped out the uh, passenger pigeon. 
passenger pigeons used to flock by the billions, I mean literally the billions through the United States, and they would darken the sky, these huge flocks. If it wasn't like days on end yeah, as they yeah, flew right, over. Right, a day and a half for these flocks to fly past a particular point. And now they're gone completely. The last one died, I think, in 1914 or something. Um, but what he thinks is that these, these birds had this um, metacognition, and they may have been doomed before um, the last one disappeared simply because they have uh, they had lost the ability to kind of all come together and make group decisions. At the, but once you, you get too small, that uh, you don't have that that uh, that leg up on on uh, on the world, and so again, one of the great unknowns, and I also one of the things that makes me wonder about how li little we know about mm. about the world, about birds, and about a lot of other things. Mm. There's, I, I found that that example quite fascinating because there's a uh, a sadly famous bird that that's found in the environs of Melbourne, on, just on the outskirts every winter, and it's the called the orange-bellied parrot, and it's a migratory parrot, one of only two two or three species in the world that migrate, and all those that migrate all migrate from Tasmania to the mainland, and we we're down to so few birds left of orange-bellied parrot. But I, I, reading the thing about the passenger pigeon and that's that sense that you talk about, almost like the the collective wisdom uh, of the of the crowd to know where to go. It, it seems like with even though there's been a lot of people working on orange-bellied parrots to try and conserve them over the years, the the flock sizes have got so small that perhaps that I, I was thinking perhaps those birds within those flocks there would be ones that would know certain tracts of the coast that where where the best places to feed are mm -hmm. and what we have seen with orange-bellied parrots as the numbers have plummeted even though they hovered around 140 birds for maybe a decade or so was they dropped out of their regular location so clearly those scouts or those th those that part of the flock went missing and, and weren't able to pass on that information and and now as the uh, researchers try and struggle on how to keep this species alive. I, I do wonder whether that that kind of critical mass that we've lost that y you talk about in the book with the passenger pigeon actually applies with with a lot of other species as well. And that that was one of the speculations of Ian Kazin. He doesn't know this, but um, he believes that at some point, even though there's maybe hundreds or even thousands of of a flock left that they may be missing the essential components needed to create this metacognition which helps them survive. Mm. One of the great unknowns, we really don't know. Uh, and an, another section of, of bird behaviour that we you, meant, you talk about in the book, you write about is, and also something that we still don't know, is the mystery of migration. Uh, the, it, it is one of the great phenomena phenomenon of nature, that, that these birds connect the planet from end to end. Uh, so many different species from the tiny ruby-throated hummingbirds that, that beat their way across the Gulf of Mexico. These birds, if they, as I understand it, if they don't eat every day, they die, and yet they can manage to fly from the Yucatan Peninsula to, to the Texas coast and survive. Uh, from those tiny things of a, just a couple of grams to, uh, you know, to, to um, bar-headed geese that f overfly the Himalayas to the shorebirds that, that, and the Arctic terns that go from the Arctic to the, essentially the, the Antarctic. Um, what, c can you sort of dis discuss the, the kinds of uh, theories on, on how these birds do it? Because it seems, uh, like I thought I knew a lot about migration, but reading reading the chapter on it, it was, uh, it's astonishing the the different techniques, the different things that birds have in their migratory toolkit to, to call upon. Can you talk to that for a, a little bit? Well, it, it seems that migration is one of those things that probably, every time they think they've figured it out, they realize they haven't figured it out. <laughs> so it's probably smells, it's probably uh, the topography of the landscape, uh, it's, it's constellations, it's, it's many things coming together for different, perhaps, from different species. Um, one of the more interesting ones, I thought, and more recent, is, is something called um, quantum entanglement, 
there's a, there's a field of quantum biology that's growing out there. Um, and the idea is that things that only seem to happen on the atomic level are apparently happening on the macro level in the physical world around us. And one of the, again, I call this book an interpretation of birds, and I think this is one of my favorite interpretations. Uh, birds have something, a chemical in their eye called cryptochrome. And th these researchers, leading researchers, believe that this chemical allows a bird to see magnetic lines on the planet that are, that are about the, a hundredth of the power of refrigerator magnets. And entanglement is, is weird. I mean, Einstein called it spooky action at a distance, so it's, it's hard to explain. But the idea is that there's a hidden connection between a bird's eye and these magnetic lines that allow this bird to see these lines somehow. Um, but yeah, uh, they also believe there's a similar process of entanglement in photosynthesis. When sunlight hits the leaf of a tree, um, it's an instantaneous reaction that takes place. There's 50 steps or more between the time the sunlight hits the leaf and, and it becomes chemical energy. But it happens so fast that there's a belief that this too is a qu kind of quantum biology. And there's arguments about it. I would not say this is settled science, but there's enough serious scientists looking at these kinds of things that, that you have to wonder what's going on. And that makes the world a lot more mysterious even than, than we know, uh, these kinds of processes. So uh, all this leads me to say to, we, should, we should affect some humility about our place in the world and, and try and understand it better and not make all of these, these irrevocable changes that we're making, you know, losing species and, and tearing down forests and, and so on because we have no clue what we're doing. And um, the, uh, there's a, a quote by um, a famous naturalist, Aldo Leopold. He said, the first rule of intelligent tinkering is to save all the pieces. And <laughs> we are not doing that. So well, that's kind of what my hope is here, is that we'll start to save all the, all the pieces. Mm. I, think, like, I think one of the um, fascinating aspects of the book, Jim, is that you do... You, you, you manage to in weave through all sorts of approaches to birds, all sorts of theories about birds, from the sort of traditional science sort of stuff to some quite out there kind of, kind of things and, and treat them all not really with any sort of value judgment, saying these are the ways that birds have got us thinking. These are the ways right. we think about birds. Um, I love the, the out there stuff, by the way. Yeah, I really do. I like to bring that stuff in and say, oh, there's serious scientists thinking about things like panpsychism. Now, what is panpsychism? Panpsychism, -psych I talked to this leading neuroscientist at one of the top institutions in the United States. He wrote a piece for Scientific American hypothesizing that, that the world, panpsychism means all-minded. And he, he believes that the world is, has consciousness. Everything in nature has consciousness, especially those animals like birds, which have these incredibly advanced nervous systems. And we should consider the world to have something along the lines of a mind or a soul and then prove that it doesn't. The, the, the way that we work, whether we realize it or not, is that we assume that nothing in the world except humans, this is called human exceptionalism, have a mind. And so once you start investing the world with a mind, your ethics change. And so I, I thought this was really interesting. And so I, I put it in there, even though it may sound a little bit out there, but if you look at Buddhist teachings and you look at other teachings, th th this is a tradition. In fact, it goes back as a philosophy in our own culture if you look back more than a century. So I think these are important things to consider. Mm. I, yeah, it, I, well, what I found, what I got, like I, I will avidly devour any book on birds that I can get my hands on. But for what I, I found particularly uh, um, intriguing uh, about this book was that it gave. It was like it was actually it was like looking at a bird th with a new pair of binoculars. Mm -hmm. It's like the, it suddenly you're seeing things that you 
you hadn't thought about or that you had but you'd sort of sublimated. And I, I want to thank you for opening up, or for me, reopening that, that sense of wonder in birds. Uh, and I, hopefully, I'm not sure whether people, how many people have yet read Jim's book. I can, as I say, highly recommend it. But for those who have, or for those who have, um, who, who just our conversation tonight has sparked anything, we, we'd, I'd like to throw open um, the, to, to you, the audience, for, for any questions. So if people do have any questions, just put your hand up and the, uh, the lovely Wheeler Centre people will, will get to you. Otherwise, we'll just keep banging on about our favourite birds for the next 15 minutes. <laughs> yes, we, we, we do have our first question. Oh, good day, Jim. Um, I've just started your book, loving it, um, but only a little bit into it. It has to go back to the library <laughs> um, at the end of this week. Just wondering, is there any chance you could sign some library copies? <laughs> uh, that, like, yeah, but you better ask the librarian. <laughs> It'd be really nice to be able to sign a, a I'm, copy. I'm happy to. Yeah. Um, just another question. I'm a bit confused. I'm getting old. But the difference between being hatched and being born, could you just elaborate on that with dinosaurs and birds? Well, uh, being hatched and being born, well, all birds are hatched, uh, but some birds are hatched and need, they're altricial, and so they need care. They're, they're helpless, but some birds are hatched ready to go. They're ready to roll on day one. And um, uh, so they're the ones that don't need parental care. And those are precocial, and then the other birds are the ones that are born and, and need, uh, need to be fed and, and, and kept warm and so on by the parents. So there's no, you know, no bird, all birds are born in hatched in eggs. <laughs> are they hatched or are they born? Is it, well, this is a, a, more a philosophical how many, yeah, uh, well, uh, just, uh, how many I mean, angel I, fish on the head of a pin? <laughs> well, I mean, a, is, a, is a bird that emerges from an egg being born? Mm, I don't know. I, 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 I can't definitively answer that. I guess it depends on how you define born. Yeah. I, maybe it's like dying and passing away. Yeah, right. <laughs> Well, so there's, there's a question I wasn't expecting. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we uh, down, have somebody down the front here. Hello. Uh, I have a couple of questions. The first one is you mentioned you started on talking about the feet and then moved on to feathers, and I wondered, Jim, if you could expand on a discussion of the feet. And secondly, it was about when you were talking, well, actually, this one's more for Sean, but for both of you, about the magpie and the uh, the slowing down of the uh, call with the bass and the melody, and I wondered if that also is related to overtones and we humans can, if you know how to do it, you can make overtones, which is connected to octaves as well, but... You know, some people can do it really well and make a melody with other overtones and things like that. So the first one was about the feet. Yeah. Uh, I, I will tell you, I, what perhaps the most interesting thing about speech is that birds learn to sing almost exactly like humans learn to speak. Um, that's why they're studied. Uh, they're a model for human speech learning, uh, vocal learning, uh, probably more than any other animal, although there's a singing mouse that they also use for a model, believe it or not. <laughs> Um, but birds learn, they listen to their parents, they try, they, they, they have their own bird babble, they call it, they kind of blah, 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 you know, as they learn, practice their speech. And uh, also the, the, the amazing thing I find, it happens with fairy wrens here, is that the mothers sing to the, the chicks when they're still in the air. Yes, yes, that's new that's research. I just talked to Sonia Kleindorfer about that. Oh, She's right. done some of that work. And um, so birds are a widely used model for understanding human speech because, of course, you can't you take apart a bird brain, but you can't take apart a human brain uh, ethically. Um, but one of the researchers I profile in the book, interesting guy, he was a, a dancer who became a scientist, Eric Jarvis. He studies hummingbird brains, and he'll go out at, at, uh, during the dawn chorus and... Um, Inter International Dawn Chorus Day, by the way, is May 5th. 
Um, it's coming up and people head out to the woods to hear the birds singing at, during the dawn. But he will go out and he'll put up a feeder and the hummingbirds will come in and they'll sing. And then he'll collect their brains. Um, so, and, some of the research that goes on is yeah. uh, kind of almost horrifying, really. Yeah, <laughs> it is. But, but it's opened up a lot of windows into how this speech process works. And he, if, it's, if he looks at a brain within half an hour or so, he can see the tracings of the hormones and, and how the, um, how the, where the song pathways are. And he's now working on trying to uh, create a pigeon. Pigeon has a syrinx, but it doesn't have the software in the brain to sing. So he's trying to create the, the pathways in the brain to allow a pigeon to sing. I don't know what, what you think of that. It sounds a little bit odd to me. Sounds but, like an Ionesco play or something. <laughs> yeah. the, the pigeon is singing. <laughs> but in a broader sense, what he's trying to do is understand the vocal uh, learning in humans, the pathways to treat things like you know aphasia after a stroke or um, to treat uh, speech defects and so on. So there is a kind of a medical side to it. A lot of the stuff that's being done to birds is, is, does have a important value possibly for therapies for, for people. What was the other part of your question? Uh, the, the, the feet. Actually, I'll continue on that question. One thing that's always fascinated me is the different orders of birds um, have different feet structures. So you'll get that the songbirds have three toes forward and one toe back, which is great for perching on twigs. But then uh, I think it's the cuckoos have two toes forward and two toes back. Mm. How did that come about? And, and I don't know. That's you know. not in the book, so I don't know about that. <laughs> you left me wanting more. <laughs> we we have oh, a foot about fetishist. The feet. Oh yes. <laughs> well, uh, there are three types of walking. Uh, 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 some animals walk on their toes. Some animals walk on the ball of their feet, and I don't remember what the third one is. But the world is divided, a world of, the animal world is divided into these three types of walking. This is in the book. I don't remember which one we are, I think. And it's, one of them is called digitigrade. It's a little too technical for me to recall all this, but there's three types of walking. Birds do all three. And they have the most versatile feet in the animal kingdom. And that's why they can, I mean, I've seen videos of birds walking up the side of a wall, walking on overhangs. Ken Dial's work with videos of birds as they move uh, really opened a whole world of understanding how versatile birds are in terms of their walking and climbing. No one really, really uh, gave that much regard up until he did his work. And, and I watched some of these videos with him. It's really quite amazing. These birds are, are expert climbers. We think of them as, um, as flyers, but they really are expert climbers. The other thing he said is, is watch the babies. If you're a twitcher, um, which is a term we don't use in the U.S., but I understand what it means. If you're a twitcher, don't watch the adults. He said, watch the babies. He said, they are evolving every day. They're growing fast. At the same time, they have to interface with their environment so they don't get eaten. So there's this amazing rapid growth that's going on yet these birds have to survive. And he thinks that's really where the most interesting aspect of birds are, is the, are the young b birds that have to survive and, and, uh, and change every day. Uh, yes, we have an, another question up here. Oh, thank you. Um, so Thank you so much. Wonderful talk. When I was a boy growing up in Africa uh, 60 years ago, we had a, an African grey parrot at the um, end of the veranda who could mimic with almost digital um, perfection uh, human conversation and um, the sound of glasses clinking. He was very annoyed he couldn't mimic a canary, but what, what um, who was also in the room with him, sadly both caged, um, what, what function would such mimicry power, powers of mimicry have uh, for this African jungle bird or bush bird? Well, the, um, the, in the book there, uh, Jim uses the, the example of the researcher Irene Pepperberg and her famous parrot, African grey parrot, uh, Alex, who, how many words, it was, he, he learnt 300 
words or so and was able to converse with her. And they, they, she, it was poo-pooed originally, but they, you know, she was able to prove over the years that they actually had, he was cognit cognitively processing conversation and would, they would actually speak. So um, do, would, do you want to uh, go? His last, go. Uh, Alex's last words were, good night, I love you. <laughs> and he died that night when Irene Pepperberg came in and, and he was dead. Um, he could make up his own words too. He he made up like um, uh, I think for an apple he called it a, a bananary, which was a combination of banana and cherry. Um, he he kind of broke the model. I mean, a lot of these things that have been discovered about birds have come in re in the last ten or twenty years. Um, as far as mimicry, the the lyre bird is probably one of the most. Mm. capable mimics. Uh, it even mimics its uh, uh, sound of chainsaws destroying its habitat. <laughs> I, uh, I've heard of ravens that um, mimic the sound of dynamite going off, explosions around road crews, or the in the campgrounds they mimic the sound of toilets flushing. Uh, <laughs> So, but I don't know what role mimicry plays in the wild. That's a good question, whether it was used as a way to kind of lure in unsuspecting birds. Uh, ravens are amazing predators. So maybe they used it to kind of uh, get other birds to come closer. Uh, there's one episode I quote an ornithologist who watched a group of eared grebes land on a lake that was frozen and they didn't know it. And after they landed, there were about 143 of them or so they couldn't take off because it was so slippery. And about four or five ravens came out onto this lake in Yellowstone Park and killed every single one of these birds because they weren't able to leave. And so there's a lot of, I mean, these are dinosaurs, remember. A lot of predation that takes place in the, in the animal world. And so maybe some of it has to, maybe some of the mimicry has to do with that. And, and certainly with the, the example of the parrots, um, the mimicry, is, as far as I understand it, is that parrots are highly social creatures and they have, uh, some parrots have been known to, the, the researchers believe they actually have names f for each member of the flock and, and they vocalise those names within their parrot language for one of, uh, one of a better term. So when you have a parrot in a cage, it feels that it's part of, it wants to be part of that social order. So it starts to mimic as it would the other parrots in its flock, but it's mimicking humans. And, and they tend to be, because it's not their natural, um, their natural language, they tend to be best mimicking the, the, the strident, stronger sounds. So that's why you find a lot of parrots mimic swear words very well. They, they can get a handle on those. Oh. And, and we had a, a famous incident, uh, it still happens, in, in Western Sydney, a, a bunch of corellas escaped uh, and they taught the wild corellas the, the language. So there are now flocks of corellas flying around Western Sydney swearing a blue murder as they, they go around. So, um, so, so I think that's, that, that's for parrots, the mimicry, but for lyrebirds, obviously, it's a completely different motivation. What are the swear words that they, uh, <laughs> they learned? <laughs> Interestingly, the, the news reports never reported on it. <laughs> I, um, one of the um, profiles in the book of a scientist in Austria studies Machiavellian politics amongst ravens. This is, this is really a thing. And they study it amongst apes too. But it, it turns out that there's something called the social complexity hypothesis. And the idea is that they think humans evolve the same way, that as you become, your brain becomes bigger, you start being able to form alliances and to your attention and your memory develop because you have to know where you hid food and you have to know who your friends are and so on that when you get into large groups, you form these kind of advanced behaviors. And so they're studying this in Ravens. This is in Vienna, or near Vienna. And, um, and it, it's, it's, it's remarkable what Ravens can do in, with language and which, with these behaviors. And um, uh, birds are, are an advanced civilization that we really haven't, haven't been able to fully understand at all. Mm. And I think that's a, a great point to, to leave it there. I'd like to thank the advanced group with the large brains that have come out tonight. 
Uh, it's been absolutely fascinating to to discuss this book with you, Jim, and I, I hope that um, the audience, I'm sure the audience would all agree. So I would uh, just like to conclude, if everybody could please thank Jim Robbins and his brilliant book, The Wonder of Birds. <laughs>